Good evening. I'm honored to be here, and I uh, thank the organizers and the staff for making this possible, and Dr. Rima Khalaf especially. Thank you very much for including me in this. One of the most ironic features of Zionism and the State of Israel is the central way that the concept of return informs their ideology and policies. Zionism's colonial project, in fact, hinged on the claim that contemporary European Jews were descendants of the ancient Hebrews of Palestine and that their colonization plan of Palestine was nothing but their strategy of, quote unquote, returning Jews to, their, to the land of their alleged ancestors after an absence of a mere two millennia. Thus, the concept of return was and remains the ideological cornerstone of Zionism and the State of Israel. In the declaration of the establishment of the State of Israel, often misidentified as Israel's Declaration of Independence, which of course is not the official name of the declaration, which was issued in May 1948, the Israeli settler colony's founders asserted, and I quote them, that after being forcibly exiled from their land, the Jewish people kept faith with it throughout their dispersion and never ceased to pray and hope for their return to it and for the restoration in it of their political freedom. In recent decades, they returned in their masses. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles." Unquote. This commitment was guaranteed by Israel in issuing what it called the Law of Return, which it legislated in July 1950, securing the right of every Jew worldwide, and I quote, to come to this country as an immigrant or Oli. In the meantime, Zionist militias were able to execute the Zionist plans of expelling the Palestinian people from their homeland beginning on, 30th, on, on the 30th of November 1947. By the time the State of Israel was declared on 14th May 1948, more than 400,000 Palestinians had been expelled. By November 48, another 400,000 Palestinians were expelled and joined their compatriots. This compelled the United Nations to issue Resolution 194 on 11th of December 1948, a resolution that was reaffirmed by the UN more than 135 times since then. The resolution stipulated, and I quote, that refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest predictable date and that compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return and for the loss or damage to property which under principles of international law or inequity should be made good by the governments or authorities responsible. The resolution further instructs the, Co the Conciliation Commission to facilitate the repatriation, resettlement, and economic and social rehabilitation of the refugees and the payment of compensation. The Israeli government has consistently rejected Resolution 194 and remains in violation of it. In an attempt to challenge the Palestinian right of return, Israel proceeded to issue a law of return for Jews one and a half years after the UN issued Resolution 194. The irony, of course, is not one wherein Israel does not recognize the right of refugees to return to their homeland, but rather that Israel recognizes only the right of Jews, whom it claims, based on its religious and colonial myth, were refugees from Palestine who had lived in exile for 2,000 years to return, while it denies that right to the Palestinians, whom it recognizes as having been displaced from Palestine. The basis of this discrepancy is not an Israeli affirmation that Jews were exiled, but that Palestinians were not, or that Palestinians did not necessarily originate in Palestine, just as it claims the Jews did. Rather, the crux of the matter for Israel is its full understanding that international law and the UN guarantee the right of return of the expelled Palestinians or the fact that international law and the UN guarantee the right of return of the expelled Palestinians negates the right of return that Israel granted to Jews worldwide. And therefore, the Jewish right to colonize the homeland of the Palestinians would be negated. <laughs> 
Now, while Theodor Herzl did not speak of the return of the Jews in his 1896 pamphlet, Der Judenstaat, or The State of the Jews, in his 1902 novel, Altneuland, he emphasized the concept of return, which he explicitly coupled with colonization. This understanding of return as colonization, as expulsion of the natives, was always explicit and never covered up by the early Zionists, who were, after all, writing during the heyday of European colonialism. In Herzl's novel, the idea was first articulated by a fictional East European character, Dr. Weiss, which the novel tells us was a simple rabbi from a provincial town in Moravia who stated in the novel, and I quote, a new movement has arisen within the last few years, which is called Zionism. Its aim is to solve the Jewish problem through colonization on a large scale. All who can no longer bear their present plot will return to our old home, to Palestine, unquote. By 1923, Vladimir Jabotinsky, the leader of revisionist Zionism, laid out the Zionist coupling of return and colonization in his manifesto, The Iron Wall. He tells us, when the whole of the civilized world has recognized that Jews have a right to return to Palestine, which means that the Jews are in principle also citizens and inhabitants of Palestine, only they were driven out and their return must be a lengthy process. It is wrong to contend that meanwhile the local population has the right to refuse to allow them to come back. Palestine consists of two national groups, the local group and these who were driven or driven out. And the second group is the larger of the two. Jabotinsky, like Herzl, understood that the so-called return of the Jews to Palestine was in fact nothing except colonization. He tells us, and I quote him, there can be no voluntary agreement between ourselves and the Palestine Arabs. It is utterly impossible to obtain the voluntary consent of the Palestine Arabs for converting Palestine from an Arab country into a country with a Jewish majority. He continues, my readers have a general idea of the history of colonization in other countries. I suggest that they consider all the precedents with which they are acquainted and see whether there is one solitary instance of any colonization being carried on with the consent of the native population. There is no such precedent. The native populations, civilized or uncivilized, have always stubbornly resisted the colonists, irrespective of whether they were civilized or savage." End of quote. In contrast with the Palestinians whose right of return is affirmed in international law and in United Nations resolutions, there are no international documents or laws that guarantee a Jewish right of return to Palestine or Israel. Neither the Balfour Declaration of 1917 nor the United Nations Partition Plan of 1947 spoke of any rights for Jews to return to Palestine. Only Israeli ideological claims and Israeli law grants them such a right. Herein lies the reason why the two rights of return are not symmetrical in Israeli argumentation any more than they are in international law. It is precisely because the European Jews' right to return to their alleged homeland could only be realized through colonization of the homeland of the Palestinians, and that Jewish colonization of the land of the Palestinians could only be realized through the expulsion of the indigenous Palestinians and ensuring the latter's inability to return to their homes, that a Palestinian right of return would undo the entire Zionist project, which is premised on their very expulsion. Exercising the internationally recognized Palestinian right of return negates the Israeli Jewish right of return to colonize Palestine and annuls the Israeli law of return. Israel understands very well that the return of the Palestinian refugees and their descendants means nothing short of decolonization and the undoing of the racist special status that Israel exclusively grants to Jews. It should be noted in, in our context today, that international law's understanding of the rights of refugees also includes the rights of their descendants to return, something to which Israel and pro-Israel forces question as illegitimate. 
Yet Israel's concept of the return of Jews as amendments to its law of return that were added in 1970 allow not only those recognized as Jews to return to Israel, but also, as the law says, and I quote, the non-Jewish child and grandchild of a Jew, the spouse of a Jew, the spouse of a child of a Jew, and the spouse of a grandchild of a Jew, except for a person who has been a Jew and has voluntarily changed his religion, unquote. This amendment is in line with Zionism's initial and permanent conception that the exclusive Jewish right of return means the Jewish right to colonize Palestine. However, Israeli assertions are not shared by the UN or international law. In addition to the annual UN reassertion of the Palestinian refugees' right of return, the right of return of displaced people was upheld in principle and practice after the Bosnian War. Upwards of half a million refugees and internally displaced persons returned with international assistance following the 1995 Dayton Agreement. They returned to their homes to areas in Bosnia, a country of three and a half million people, dominated demographically and politically by members of another ethnic community. As the Bosnian case clearly demonstrates, the right of return of refugees trumped the racially separatist policies of the local authorities who sought to continue to control the land of the displaced refugees and to po populate it demographically with their own ethnic group at the expense of the refugees. International enforcement of the Bosnian refugees' right uh, right of return was based on the well-established right of return of refugees in international law and in UN resolutions, while demographic racial separatism had no moral or legal standing whatsoever in enforcing the refugees' right of return. This is the case today also with the right of Somali refugees and their descendants to return to their country. It is this established right that the Trump administration is seeking to undo by its ongoing attempts to destroy UNRWA and to redef redefine who is or is not a refugee. With Palestinians outnumbering Jews today across Israeli-occupied Palestine, Israel's enactment of the nation-state law in July 2018 was engineered to secure racial Jewish supremacy in the country after Israel's dismal failure to secure Jewish demographic supremacy. The Israeli conception of rights is not universal, but always particular. Indeed, always Jews-specific. It is this particularism that Israel seeks to render compatible with, internationals, with international law's universalism. If the universalism of the Palestinian right of return that is based on international law and on UN resolutions is undone in favor of the Israeli particularism of a Jewish right of return that can be imposed by US and Israeli diktat as the new basis of international law, then the threat of a Palestinian return would be neutralized and the right to continue Jewish colonization of Palestine would be guaranteed. The Trump administration's recent decision affirming that Jewish colonial settlements in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights are not in contravention of international law is the, uh, is the logical outcome of and follows from Israel's and Trump's earlier efforts to deny the Palestinians the right of return by redefining who is or is not a refugee. The Zionist colonization of Palestine was based on a particularist Jewish right of return as colonization, as expulsion of the Palestinians. In short, it was based on racial supremacy that justified this alleged right. The Palestinian struggle today, therefore, must not waver on the implementation of the right of the Palestinians to return, as this right is the legal key to undoing the Zionist conquest of Palestine in its entirety. Israel and its U.S. ally understand this very well, which is why they are fighting with all their might to undo it. Thank you very much.